I need to have a caveat right here off, off the top. We, we like it here in South Florida, right? There, we, it's nice, especially in the winter. It's, it's awesome right now. And people are like, oh, it's so hot, especially like last Monday and last weekend was so hot. But you know what? I grew up in Atlanta. It was just as hot there, right? I, I lived in St. Louis for three years. It's ridiculous there. And there's no wind. You know, we get wind here. Like, there's no wind in St. Louis. It just gets hot. And you know what also it does in St. Louis? It gets cold. Hot and cold. The, the two evils don't cancel each other. All right? <laughs> like, all, all that stuff. So, like, that, that's, that, that's, it, it does, does, it was blasted hot. But I have to take umbrage with one thing. The barbecue here is lacking. All right? <laughs> The, 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 bar, the pulled pork here is, is it's lacking, right? And, and, that's like, and some of you are like, no, there's good places. That's because you've never lived in the true south or anything like that, right? So the people that like, like uh, most of my Alabama folks, all of Greta, Alabama barbecue versus here. Yeah, exactly, right? Like that's, like that's, it's, it's no comparison, no comparison. It's, it's incredible. And I have to say, you know, I, it's, I try not to talk about the previous girlfriend in Arkansas, but that's, but, but the barbecue there was on every corner and it was really good, right? Like that's, and cheap, cheap, like barbecue here is so expensive. Anyway, what am I trying to talk about? My friend Mark, who's over in Tampa, he loves barbecue just as much as I do, and f- he loves it so much that, that his barbecue place near his house is where he goes. When it, whenever they have anyone visiting the church, they're like, you want to go to Four Rivers? Let's go to Four Rivers Barbecue. And he's like, we're heading over there. And he even did this. They invited a speaker co- that came in from Jews for Jesus. <laughs> See, you guys... You're quicker than my friend a little bit there. And I'm throwing him under the bus a little bit on this story, but it's okay. He's telling this story to his congregation too, all right? But he, you know, you guys, you, you guys are catching on what's going on. This guy from Jews for Jesus, right? He's, he's in the car and he's talking about how great the pulled pork is, right? Uh, over there. So that, 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 that sets you up uh, for kind of what we're talking about today. Right? That's that kind of set you up. Because you guys know what's going on you know, the, over there. Yeah, that's not, you know, the guy may not partake in the pork. Right? Like that, that's, you guys know what's going on. So, picture what's going on in Acts at this point. Picture what's going on. Paul has been, he's gone out into the Gentile regions. He, and he's having great success. You know, all of these people are coming over and, there's, and they're seeing how there's freedom in Jesus. That, that, that they are saved. That they don't have to work for it. That Jesus just comes to them and saves them, right? And, and they come back to kind of the church heads and all of that. And they're telling them, regaling them of all these stories that have happened of all these people that have come over to the way, as they called it, to be called to, and being called Christians and, and seeing the freedom that's found in Jesus. And then you have a guy, we'll call him Dale. And Dale is in the back and he's like, and he, and he puts his hand up and he's like, are, are, are these people circumcised? Are, 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 are these, have these people like, have they converted over to Judaism? Like over there, and we look at that question, and we're like, because hardly any of us are Jewish in here, right? We're like, oh, no, freedom in Christ, you know, all that stuff. Like, we, we look at that question, and we're like, no, 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 that's, that, why are they answering that? But you think about that day and time. Think, think about what people were doing back then. Like, what the message was. You know, we're, what, 30 years after Jesus? The, Christ, the Christians are becoming Christians out of the ministry of the synagogues. You know, Paul is first going to the Jews. Then he usually says something that upsets them in the synagogues and they kick him out. Then he goes to the Gentiles. But after Paul leaves, they probably, those new Christians that are Gentiles, that are Greeks, they're probably coming back to the synagogue to hear more about this God, to hear about this Jesus that came from this God right? That they come over here and, and they're, they are now part of these kind of Jewish kind of synagogues. 
that, are, that they're believers in Jesus. And here Paul is talking about all these people converting over and, and, and Dale is in the back going, yeah, but. Are, are, they, are, are, they, are, they, actually, are they actually circumcised? Are, are, are they actually becoming Jewish? It makes sense, doesn't it? Like it makes, when you look at it, it's like, okay, I can kind of see where they're talking about. We'll kind of we'll read some of the scripture parts again so you can just kind of get some sense of it. So this is right at the beginning of 15. But some of the men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Dale is going, are these people circumcised? Because they need to be. Can you, you can hear their arguments even too. You know, they get, their, they get their Torah out. You know, they don't have the bounded books and all that stuff. They, they get the Torah out and it's like, see, look, it says right here that they need to be circumcised. What, has God, not, has God changed? You can hear these people saying this, right? Has God changed? You know, like, this is the same God. We're saying that Jesus has come from God, that He's God's Son over there. Has God changed? Would he, why would He get rid of of the commands of Moses. And, and after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, we got to take issue with some English translations of the Bible. Do you guys ever talk about they had no small portions of ice cream at that place or something? I don't know. It's weird English. After Paul and Barnabas had a huge argument and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders and ask about this question. So, people, so Dale's standing up in the back. It's like, listen, these people need to be circumcised. We, they, they need to become part of us. They need to become part of the initiation because this is what God has commanded us throughout the thing. And he's like, I don't think God changes. You know, like, I could see this guy saying this, right? And, and Paul's like, all right, all right. Well, let's go back to the church head in Jerusalem, and we will talk it out. You know, and the, and the leader of the church then was this guy named, named James. Now, James is the brother of Jesus. Can't you see the resemblance in this picture, photograph of him? The, James is the brother of Jesus, at least we think so. And he didn't even, ha he wasn't even, he didn't think Jesus was the Messiah uh, until, until he was, after Jesus had ascended into heaven and all that. And here he is as, uh, as the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And they come to him. And here's what, what I think is amazing. Is their solution. Their solution is amazing. Because their solution is so, it's a weird thing to say, but it's pastoral. Their solution is in love. Their solution is in love, and it's thinking about the people that are there. Their solution is, is there. And we can see it in just a little bit later. We... It says this in, in verse 19. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. You hear that? We should not trouble the Gentiles who turn to God, but we should write a letter to them that they should abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and, and from blood. For the ancient generations, for, uh, from the ancient generations, Moses has, has had in every city those who have proclaimed him, for he has read in every Sabbath in the synagogues. So, what does that mean? It means that those Christians are probably in those synagogues. And, those, and the people in the synagogues are saying, you need to be circumcised. And they're like, we have freedom in Christ. Paul said so, right? They're, they're saying all these, it's, and, it's, and it's really contentious. And so what they tell the Gentiles, it's like, hey guys, you don't need to be circumcised. But since you're going to be hanging around all the Jews, 
Don't eat pork in front of them. Don't eat a BLT in front of them. Don't, don't, don't eat all that. Don't go over to the temple. I know you have full freedom that you can do whatever you want, but don't do it right in front of them, right? Why? Because it's a mean thing to do. And some people may actually, may actually think that you're serious and they're like, ooh, I'm worried about his salvation and they could actually hurt themselves more. In, in other words, here, here's, I'll, I'll, I will, this letter, this letter to the Gentiles and to the Jews that the church wrote can be summed in a couple words. The nice way of saying it is act in love towards your neighbor. The crass way of saying it is don't be a jerk. All right? Like that's, because that's what it's about. It's about don't, don't act really. And this is great advice for us today, is it not? Because how often do we love being a terrible person to people around us, especially those that we disagree with? Some of you aren't shaking your heads and like, oh yes, hallelujah, right? Like, some of you aren't doing that yet. But I've heard all of our stories about how we handle the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, Right? Like, you, you guys all know there's, there's always that one person, man, in seminary, when I, was, when I was going through all the pastor training stuff, those were the big stories right there, is how you handled the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses that came to your house, right? I, I had this one seminary friend, and we would sit around the tables, and we would laugh at, at these stories. He's like, I would invite them in, and I would offer them coffee, and it, because Mormons aren't allowed to have coffee, you know? And I would offer, and I would offer them beer because they're not allowed to have, drink alcohol. And, and they're like, they wouldn't accept it. Ha, 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 right? You know, or you're like, you have all these like verses in your head and you're like, these are takedowns. And uh, you know, we're going to own the Mormons, own the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Ah, suddenly it doesn't feel as comfortable. So, suddenly, I'm uncomfortable with that. You know? Because we have all the freedom in Christ. We can gladly take, we can gladly take a giant bite out of a pulled pork sandwich. We can gladly take a sip of German lemonade. That's called beer. So we called it in seminary at least. We can take a sip out of that, right? We can, we can do anything in Christ, but not everything is beneficial. And sometimes we take that freedom that we have and we rub it in the face of someone else so that we can be higher than them, so we can be better than them. I don't, I don't know, right? We, we do that though, right? And, and Paul talks about that. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians. He says, listen, all things are lawful. All th we can do anything. We have freedom to do anything. But not everything is helpful. I mean, all, all things are fine. But not all things build people up. You know, like, let no one seek just his own good, but to seek the good of the neighbor. So whether you eat or drink, whether you, you do... Do it for the glory of God. Now let me ask you a question. We got to quick think about something. He says, whatever you do, do for the glory of God. There's a lot of people that quote that, right? I imagine some of you have a Bible cover that probably has on it, living to the glory of God or something like that. I don't know. I probably have a mug at my house that has that set on it somewhere, right? All that stuff. How is Paul defining living to the glory of God here? What's right before it? Loving the neighbor. Loving the neighbor. Let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor so that when you eat and drink, you give glory to God. That you would love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what I see from that Jerusalem council from James. And, and they looked at this issue of circumcision and they looked at this issue of eating pork and bacon in front of, the Jewish, of their Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. They looked at them and they said... Love your neighbor. Love the people that are around you. Sure, you have freedom to do whatever you want. Christ has set you free. He's taken the yoke of slavery off of you. 
but love your neighbor. If it's going to bother them, stop it. You know? Like that's, and I remember, and I hate being like the best ones in my, in, in my stories, so I try not to do that, but like I, I remember when that clicked in my head uh, in how I dealt with the Mormons that came to the house. Because I realized, so back, back in Arkansas, there were Mormons everywhere. For some reason, that area was, it was like a little Utah. You know, it was, just, it was just filled with Mormon churches and lots of people. So this is kind of a constant stream coming to your house. And that was just the way of it. But I remember after having a conversation and doing some reading, I, I, I realized something that, that, they, that the Mormons used the word grace but they don't use it in the same way we do. To them, grace is something that you earn. And when I realized that, it made me so sad for them because they were under a bondage that they had to constantly be earning this grace and favor with God. And so whenever they came knocking on the door, we would usually invite them in and talk to them and, you know, and, and I would hear them out, you know, and all that stuff. Because it's, you know, that's, it's, they're 18 years old. They're kids. I can't believe I say that now, but it's true. I'm 37. <laughs> but they're kids, right? They've worked hard on this. The least I can do is respect their time. And I would always talk to them. And, you know, we'd have a debate, you know, and all that stuff too and all, all of that. But I would, and I would always tell them, I would say, listen, remember my name. Remember who I am because I probably won't be here forever. I'm not. I'm in Florida now. But, but if for some reason you do something and no one accepts it where you are, give me a call because God still loves you. Because God still loves you. And, and, that, and that, that was something that changed to me where they, 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 the, the, the Mormons quit being a prize to win for me. And it was just someone I wanted them to have hope in something outside of themselves. To have hope in the gospel there. And that's what Paul is saying in his thing. He's saying that everything is free. You're free to do everything, but not everything is beneficial. You're, you're free to do anything. You know, all things are lawful, but not everything is beneficial. And it's so, I'm so grateful that Jesus treats us that same way, that he comes to us, that he came and he looked at us and he didn't tell us, well, you need to shape up in order to have salvation. No, he came and saved us just where we are. He gives us freedom so that we don't have to worry about our salvation so that we have complete freedom to love our neighbor as ourselves. So we don't have to worry about what's going on inside of here. We have complete freedom to serve our neighbor. So, my friend Mark, right? So he's going to Three Rivers Barbecue with the Jews for Jesus guy who's named Jeremiah, by the way. Like, this guy is a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? Like, this guy, he, he is it. And, and Mark, being the good pastor that he is, and he's a great pastor, he's much better than me. He, he drives along, and he's on his way, you know, excited about his pulled pork sandwich, and, he's, and he looks over at him, he's like, do you still observe all the, the Jewish <laughs> kosher laws? And the guy's like, yeah. So, Four Rivers is probably not the place we should go with the pulled pork and all that. And the guy goes, I'll go wherever you want. And I think they went to Applebee's, which is probably worse. But uh, we won't go into that. <laughs> but it's, we won't go into that. So, so but, but he, he, he recognized that. And, and I, I, I want to bring up something that Kevin talked about. And it's about me. And, uh, but I didn't even think about it before Sunday school today. And I would bring Kevin up here, but I'm, I have the stage and it's all about me. And uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, but what he said is, for those of you who kn knew what I used to do um, at, at, my, at my previous churches, I, I never really wore a robe until here. 
I don't even really like wearing the robe. I complain about it constantly. You know why? Because we're in South Florida, and it's like wearing blankets. <laughs> right? But why do I wear it? Because the congregation here, if I didn't wear it, all you would see is that there's not a robe. And you wouldn't hear any kind of gospel or good news that comes out of my mouth. So I wear a robe. And my question for all of you today, I have freedom not to. I could take this thing off. And you guys would complain and complain. And I would be talking about my freedom in Christ, right? But what I want to ask for you today is, what is the robe for you that's inhibiting people from hearing the good news from Jesus? What is that? What is the pulled pork barbecue that is inhibiting, right? And something I read this week, uh, like, amazed me. You know, you know that quote, if you teach a man to fish, you know, he'll, you'll feed him for a lifetime, but if you just give him, you feed him for a day? I want to be the same way with you guys. You know how easy it is to tell you, don't do this, don't do this, do this, don't do that over there, do, do that. Like, that, that's easy. And, and you love it. You're like, oh, I can, do, like, I can do these things and then Jesus will love me. The problem with that is that's not what our story is about today. Our story is about looking at your neighbor and loving them. Listen, I'm 37 years old. I live at 514 South, Southwest Maple Terrace, Southeast Maple Terrace, right? I have my neighbors around me. I'm a different age. I'm a different person. I have different neighbors in a different street than where you live. That means your situation and how you need to love your neighbors is different than how I need to. It's not as easy as me telling you, go do this and do this. It's a much harder thing to go, go love your neighbors as yourselves. Because Jesus first loved us and gave everything for us. And that's a very hard thing to end on, but also it's very good news. And we'll end right there.